Listen to the conversation and answer questions one to six. Good morning, Country Comfort Albury. Oh hi, I'd like some information, please. I'd like to find a double room to stay for the weekend. What kind of rooms do you have? Well, we provide a variety range of accommodation depending upon your likes. The guest house room costs forty-five dollars per night. It provides air conditioning and shower, and a waterfront room costs eighty dollars per night. It has got its own balcony overlooking the foreshore of the lake. And we've got a kid. How do you charge for children? Extra bedding is available if you require that. If the kid is aged twelve and below, the cost is ten dollars per night for the guest house room and fifteen dollars for the waterfront room. Do you have a swimming pool, tennis court, or something like that? Yes, we've got a swimming pool, which is free for all the guests. But the tennis court charges eight dollars each hour, including the rent of rackets. How about other facilities? We provide free off-street car parking and internet access. We also installed in-house movies, but that costs four dollars per hour. Oh, we don't think we need that because of the kid, you know. We don't want him to see movies on the weekend. Well, we also offer ironing equipment in the room. That's useful, I think. Now listen to the last part of the conversation and answer questions seven to ten. Great. Could you tell me the address? How do we get there? Yes, it's Country Comfort Albury, A L B U R Y, at six hundred and forty-eight Dean Street, New South Wales. Six four eight Dean Street, D E A N. Is that right? Yes. Well, I wonder what activities are available there in this season. You know, we want to have an indulgent weekend in the boring winter. Oh, you'll not get bored here. You know, Albury is the perfect base for alpine skiing. Besides that, winter's frosty alpine air encourages walks through mist-laden valleys. You can walk alongside rushing streams and waterfalls. After returning to the warm and comfortable lounge, you can sit by the open fire. I think this is the ideal time of year to nourish your body at the Salus Spa. The idea of skiing doesn't appeal to me very much, but it sounds good to have a relaxing walk through the valleys. Maybe after that, I'll have a massage and some soaking in the spa. And you know, this hotel is perfectly located in a quiet position off the main highway in central Albury. It's within walking distance of licensed clubs, restaurants, shops, and the central business district. It's known for its excellent cuisine and warm Australian hospitality. Good. It's a good idea to taste the tasty dishes in one of the restaurants. My wife may be interested in shopping. She's always keen on that. I think I'll contact you later. Thank you very much. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions eleven to sixteen. Keep 'em out. There's no fail-proof way to keep out a burglar, but every little bit of deterrence helps. Even if you can't afford a security system, you can take a few minutes to make your home a little safer. Some relatively simple steps will greatly decrease the odds of a break-in, which means you can enjoy a bit more peace of mind. And isn't that what home is all about? Think like a burglar. If you were one, how would you get into your home? Evaluate your home from the inside and out, night and day. You might even try a mock break-in, trying window jams and loose locks on your house's perimeter. To keep out a burglar, the first thing to do is to secure the windows. Though windows are relatively easy to break, the loud noise of shattering glass will deter a thief if you're near other houses. Don't leave windows open during the night, whether you're at home or away. That's a common sense precaution. But a surprising number of people forget to do just that. Use a pick-proof locking device for your windows. Make sure the frames are solid. If you're beyond the earshot of your neighbours, they won't hear the glass breaking. 
Consider installing a plexiglass sheet for the more accessible windows. This will make entry through them more difficult. Your doors should also be secured. If you don't have a peephole, install one in the front door. If you have one, make sure that you and your family are in the habit of using it. Don't open the door to anyone you don't know, especially at night. If the peephole is out of reach of your children, keep a stepladder or stepping box by the door for them to use. If there's any glass within two feet of your front door lock, consider a locking device that would be out of reach if the glass is broken. Now, a few tips on how to protect your valuables. Don't leave your valuables, stereo, computer, jewellery, etc., where they can be seen from the window. If you don't want to hide everything from sight, consider blinds. Make a valuables inventory. Keep a record of your expensive and personally significant items, not just a listing, but a photographic or videotape record if possible. Store this inventory at another location. This is helpful for both the police and the insurance agency to identify the stolen goods. Use an engraving pen to mark these items with some kind of personal identifying information, such as your initials, in an inconspicuous place. This also helps record your possessions in case of any other mishap, such as fire or flood. As the talk continues, answer questions 17 to 20. Don't stop your security awareness at the outside walls of your house. Your yard areas, if any, also deserve your attention. In general, don't leave anything around the yard that might help a burglar get into your house. Ladders, stackable boxes or any garden tools should be put away, preferably in a locked cabinet. Install a light in your yard that is sensitive to movement. Place it high and out of reach. Trim hedges or bushes that are near doors or windows. These can be good hiding places. Don't place outdoor furniture tables nearby the house. These could become an easy stepladder to the roof. When you are on vacation, create the occupancy illusion. Maybe you laughed at your mother for leaving the lights on and the radio playing while she left for vacation, but she had the right idea. Those steps aren't quite enough, so try these strategies. Buy electronic timers that turn lights on and off at different times. Hook up a timer to your TV for a few hours each evening. Turn up the volume too. Not enough to annoy the neighbours, just enough that a lurker at the windowsill couldn't miss hearing it. Have your newspaper and mail delivery suspended. If you don't have time to do this, ask a neighbour to pick them up for you. Ask a neighbour to park in your driveway or parking place. Think about having someone house sit your home. If it's a relative or friend, it may cost you no more than the contents of your refrigerator. You can also find professional house sitters or house sitting services that find someone to stay while you're away. Leave your shades as they are normally, or at least don't close up everyone. One sign of a vacant house is closed shades during the day. Lock your garage door with a padlock. Now please listen to the recording and answer questions 21 to 24. Well, Mr Jackson, the first and important thing I have to tell you is that um, there is really nothing seriously wrong with you. Physically, that is. My, uh, my very thorough re-examination and the, the analyst's report show that basically you are very fit. Yes, very fit. So, why is it, Doctor, that I'm always so nervy, tense, ready to jump on anybody, my wife, children, colleagues. I think, um, I think your condition has a lot to do with, um, shall we call it, way of life, habits? Way of life? Habits? Yes, now tell me, Mr Jackson, you smoke, don't you? Yes, I'm afraid, I'm afraid I do, Doctor. 
And、uh, rather heavily, I imagine. Well, yes. I smoke what about forty, fifty a day, I suppose. You should do your best to stop, you know. Yes, I see. But uh, well, it won't be the first time. I've tried to give up smoking several times, but it's it's no good. You see, fifty a day is overdoing it. You must admit, you must cut down at least that. Oh yes, I know that when you're feeling tense, you 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 probably feel that a cigarette relaxes you. But in the long run, I do advise you to make, to make a real effort to quit smoking. Of course, but well, it's easy to say give it up or cut it down, but oh, you know. Well, in my opinion, you have no choice. Either you make a real effort, or or there's no real chance of your feeling better. You see, well, obviously, I could prescribe some kind of tranquilizer, but would that help? I'd prefer, and I'm quite sure you'll agree, I'd prefer to see you really back to normal, not just seemingly so. And that's my reason for asking you several more questions about about your other habits. Right. As you listen to more of their conversation, answer questions twenty-five to thirty. Your eating habits, for example. What do you eat normally during a normal day? Yes, well, I'm a good eater. Yes, I'd say I'm a good eater. Now let's see. Up at eight in the morning, and my wife has a good breakfast ready. A good breakfast. The usual. A cereal followed by bacon and eggs with fried bread and perhaps a tomato or two, then toast and marmalade, all washed down with a couple of cups of tea. I uh yes, I really enjoy my breakfast. Uh yes, I can see you do, but I'd advise you to eat rather less. We'll come to that later. Go on. Then lunch, no first brunch, a cup of coffee and a bun at eleven. Lunch has to be quick because there's so much to do in the office about that time. So I have a pint and a sandwich in the pub. All very hurried. Try to be in less of a hurry. But I make up for it in the evening. I get home at about seven. Dinners around about eight. Uh, yes, my wife's an excellent cook. Excellent. It's usually some meat dish, and we like spaghetti as a first course. Spaghetti, a meat dish, cheese, sweet, but、uh, but then at the end of the day, shall we say, then? Well, then I begin to feel on edge again. Most evenings after dinner, we read or watch TV, but I I get this terrible feeling of tension. Well, I'm sorry to have to say this because you obviously enjoy your food, but、um, I really do recommend. That you, that you eat less, and secondly, that you eat more healthily. Instead of having that enormous breakfast, for example,、um, well, try to be content with fruit juice and some cereal. I see, but、uh... eleven says right. Well, that's all right, but lunch should be more leisurely. Remember, your health is at stake, not your job. As for dinner,、um, I'd advise you to eat a soup, perhaps with a salad, a salad followed by some fruit. But my wife's cooking is superb, granted, and she probably enjoys preparing delicious meals for you. If you like, well,、um, I'll have a word with your wife. No, that won't be necessary.、Uh, thanks, just the same, doctor. But no. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. My group has been doing a project on the importance of architecture in people's lives, and whether it has any impact on the lives of people in general. The main part I have played is in the collection of data to find out what effect, if any, various buildings have on people's mood, i.e., whether ugly buildings make people unhappy, and whether beautiful buildings do the opposite. We had originally thought of starting measuring people's reactions by using a questionnaire with about forty questions, 
which we were going to hand out to people, including students at the university. But we were worried that doing the questionnaire would be too time-consuming for people to fill in, so we gave up the idea. I then asked several of the postgraduate students for advice. One of them came up with the simple idea of showing people images of various buildings from different eras and styles, instead of giving out the questionnaire, and asking them to indicate how they felt on a scale of 1 to 5 about the images, where 1 was unhappy and 5 was very happy. People would also be given the option of not saying what they felt. Using the scale meant that it would be much simpler to record people's reactions. I decided to follow this advice, and so the first stage was to collect a large number of images. I used Google to print off colour images of views of houses and apartment blocks where people live, and different types of buildings where they work. I started with about 30 or 40, and then reduced them to 10 images. Media resources in the Amory building at the Judd Street branch of the university helped me produce the final images. I had them blown up to A4 size, and we used colour rather than black and white to make the detail on the images clearer. We made five sets of images, and for protection when handling, we pasted the images onto hard card. Then, using a machine to wrap them with plastic, we laminated the cards. Five of us targeted different age groups. We went to a local school where we obtained permission to ask a group of teenagers between 11 and 18. We also asked a sample of the general public, including tourists from all over the world, as they exited the Tate Modern in London, what they thought. We aimed to ask people from different age groups, namely 20 to 40 and 50 and over. What our group learnt most from the project was first of all the value of teamwork. And secondly, we found that we had to appoint a leader to stop us pulling in different directions and falling apart. So this turned out to be an invaluable lesson for all of us. As to the findings, for us they proved intriguing. In the end, the sample consisted of 311 respondents. I thought initially that people wouldn't be interested in taking part. With the youngest age group, their reaction was very mixed. It was clear that the youngest group had no pattern of preference at all, as they frequently gave no reaction to the pictures. For the 20 to 40 age group, we found that they tended to score more in the middle range, around three. We found that out of the three groups, the most likely to be favourably affected by the images, that is, they were more likely to score the images as five, were those aged 50 and above. And nobody in this age group failed to say what their reaction was, which was unique for the three groups. In total, I have to say that about 71 people indicated that they had no reaction at all to an image. Our general conclusion is that we need to find out more about why people react as they do, by perhaps giving them a chance to give reasons for their decisions. I would like to finish there and give my teammates a chance to add anything I've missed or take any questions or suggestions. You now have half a minute to check your answers.